praise and we give you all the glory and all God's people said. You can remain seated. Just join with us and sing about this great high priest we have, Jesus Christ. spring weather has come upon us. Amen. But as you can see up here, every time spring happens, I begin to melt. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and uh, so I love the winter. I when I come to Tennessee so I can get away from all that heat of Florida. Uh, but, uh, but what a joy it is to be here this morning. And we are thankful for the break in the cold weather and God is starting to bring things to life. The birds are starting to sing. It's just a marvelous time of year. Amen. A marvelous time of year as we are entering into, as we watch life come from death and, uh, and how God reminds us of that, his power and how he does that, not only with creation, but how he does that with us. There are seasons in our lives, amen? Sometimes those seasons are long, dark, and cold, and sometimes they are scorching hot, but sometimes he puts us in the perfect environment, amen? And right now in the afternoons, is it not just perfect? We can open up our windows of our houses and let them breathe, and that breeze that blows through, it's just like, 
Oh, so refreshing. Amen? And that's what church is like to me. Every time I come in here, it's like I pulled the windows of my house open and letting that breeze just blow in and getting that fresh air in there helps me to remember there are good things in this old crazy world no matter what's going on. Amen? And um, there was the first person in the United States who became a millionaire. And that man knew how to set goals and follow them. And at the age of 23, he became a millionaire. And by the age of 50, he became the first billionaire. Every decision, attitude, and relationship was tailored to create his personal power and wealth. But three years later, after making his first billion dollars at 53, he became seriously ill. His entire body became racked with pain. He lost all of his hair on his head. He was in complete agony, and the world's only billionaire could buy anything he wanted, but he could not, he, but he could, he could only digest milk and crackers. An associate wrote of him, he could not sleep, he would not smile, and nothing in life meant anything. He said these words, his personal highly skilled physicians predicted that he would die within a year. That year passed with agonizingly slow degradation. As he approached death, he awoke one morning with a vague remembrance of a dream. He could barely recall the dream, but knew it had something to do with not being able to take any of his successes from this world with him into the next world. The man who could control, who, the man who could, could control the business of the world suddenly realized he was not in control of his own life. And he was left with a choice. And so he called his attorneys, his accountants, and his managers and announced that he wanted to channel all of his assets to hospitals, research, and mission work. On that day, John D. Rockefeller established his foundation. And in this new foundation, with this new direction, it eventually led to the discovery of penicillin, cures for the common strains of malaria, tuberculosis, and diphtheria. The list of discoveries resulting from his choice was enormous, but perhaps the most amazing part of Rockefeller's story is this. That as he began to give away all that he had earned, his body's chemistry suddenly was altered so significantly that he began to get better. And the more he released of the worldly possessions in which he had, the better he became physically day by day. And when he thought he wouldn't make it past 53, he ended up living to the good age of 98. Trying to give the world will kill you. And sometimes it will make you absolutely sick to the point of death. In Christ, he comes to teach us that by letting go, we actually bring health to our bodies, not bondage. By taking on, the more we take on, the more we get, the more bondage that comes to pass. Now, John D. Rockefeller was not a Christian, never claimed to be a Christian. But the principle still remained that when he was just solely set on just becoming the first world's billionaire and gathering all the wealth and the riches of the world, when it came to him and, and realizing that it didn't matter how much money he had, if he was about to die, what was the point? And said, better just to give it all away than to die. I can't take it with me, right? And so often is the world right now. But that's why I say, y'all listen to me. As we look around the world right now, we see the wars that's ensuing and the things that are going on. Don't y'all know that there are able-bodied men and women who did have a job yesterday that have no job today? That they had a country that was theirs and now it's a country that's not theirs. That at any moment, at any moment that America could be in the same situation and it won't matter how much wealth you have in that moment if you're running with bombs bursting over the top of your heads. Amen. It will not matter how much money and things you've accomplished in this world if God intends to turn this country around. And we find this to be evidently true also with the nation of Israel. And I want to show you that this morning because we're, remember we're talking about stewardship. And everybody has been not so uh, upset with the preacher as he's been dealing with time and talent. But this morning you might be a little angry when you leave here this morning because now I'm going to deal with your treasure. Amen. <laughs> But the reality is, is I'm not going to deal with your treasure. God is, okay? I want you to take your Bibles, though, and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And if you get there, would you please stand in the reverence of the reading of God's Word. Deuteronomy chapter 8. And would you read with me verse 11 
through 14. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 11. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command you this day. Least thou when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built God goodly houses and dwelt therein, and when thy herds and thy flocks have multiplied and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then in thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt and from this house of bondage. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Father, we pray that as we take a glance here this morning and look at this uh, topic of how to steward our treasures, Lord, may we not be like the nation of Israel in which you brought you prospered beyond any nation ever before them. And yet they came to a utter demise because they forgot the Lord their God. And they began to worship the things of the world rather than worshiping the one who made the world. Oh God, put our, our, our hearts and minds on these things as we look at them this morning. Help us to recognize that it's our wealth will either be a blessing to us or it will be a curse, a curse to us. But God, help us to see our wealth in the right light as you are the owner of all things. And you're the, you're the one who has given us life and allowed us to rise up in the morning and to have a mind that can think and eyes that can see and ears that can hear and mouths that can talk and feet that can walk and hands that can handle, blood that plumps through our veins, lungs that can breathe, heart that continues to function. God, you are the sustainer of life and everything in it. And we pray that as this morning, as we take a look at this word that we see here in Deuteron Deuteronomy chapter 8, that you will, Lord, just allow us to thank you for all that you've done for us and not get our eyes off of you and on it. Not get our eyes on the stuff, but keep our eyes on the God who's given us the stuff. And we pray it and say it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. There's a man in the church one Sunday, and his business was beginning to take off, and he was doing really well. And he went to the pastor, and he made a covenant with the pastor according to a, pa a sermon that he had preached on tithing. And he had made the covenant that he was going to 10%, he was going to tithe 10% of the income that he made each year. And, uh, and so but things began to change as the, the, the layman, he tithed $1,000 every year that he made $10,000, $10,000 a year every time he earned $100,000, and $100,000 a year every time he earned a million. But the year where he earned $6 million, <laughs> he just couldn't bring himself to write out that check for $600,000 to the church. And so he telephoned the pastor and said, long since had moved to an, after moving to another church, and he asked him to see, and, and walking into the pastor's office, uh, the man begged, begged uh, to be let out of the covenant, saying, this tithing thing has to stop. It was fine when I tithed on $1,000, but I just can't afford $600,000. You've got to do something about this, Reverend. And the pastor knelt down on the floor and began to pray silently, and he was praying for a long time. And eventually the man said, what are you doing? Are you praying that God will let me out of the covenant to tithe? And he said, no. I'm praying for God to reduce your income back to the level where $1,000 will be what your tithe is. <laughs> <laughs> Amen? Where are you comfortable in your tithing this morning? Do you tithe at all? Do you biblically tithe? Well, I want to bring this before us for the next three weeks. That if you do not, you are missing out on probably the biggest blessing of your Christian walk in faith. One person wisely says, if you want to know what someone loves, look at what they spend their money on. Hmm. But if they don't spend their money, you know what they love. And the love of money is the root of? The root of money. The, the love of money is the root of all evil. And you look around the world today, y'all, and I'm telling you, this thing is becoming very evident to the very eyes of everyone who's watching. The power and control and money is what everybody is killing one another for. And we're killing ourselves for it. And are we really any better for it? Are we really better today by all the prosperity in which we've been given? Or are we much worse off? When our country had nothing, we had people of integrity and honesty and hard work ethics and now that our country has come to this place of prosperity beyond any nations around us we've become greedy and we've become untrustworthy and we no longer are people of integrity and we are losing losing what it means to believe in the one and true and only God who is the giver of all things 
Andrew Murray said this, the world asks, what does a man own? But Christ asks, how does he use it? Amen. The world asks, what do you own? By what you own makes you somebody. But Christ says, by what you have, how do you use it? That what makes you somebody in his eyes. How do you use what God has given to you? One unknown author said these words, my take on tithing in America is that it's a middle class way of robbing God. Tithing to the church and spending the rest on your family is not a Christian goal. It's a diversion. The real issue is, how shall we use God's trust fund, namely, all we have for His glory? In a world with so much misery, what lifestyle should we call our people to live? What example are we setting? Charles Spurgeon said these words, You say, if I had a little more, I should be very satisfied. You make a mistake. If you are not content with what you have, you will not be satisfied even if it was double. Watchman Nee said this. One gains by losing self for others and not by hoarding to oneself. The more you give away, the more God will bless you. Amen. I promise you the Bible says, man, listen, test God and see. If you won't do what he asks you to do, and if he won't open up the portals of heaven and pour out on you a blessing so large that you can't even contain it. See, either God is true or God's a liar. If God is true, say amen. amen. Is God's word true this morning? Say amen. amen. Well, God's word promises you that, that this issue of tithing is a big issue. And it's found throughout all of scripture. It's not just an Old Testament issue and a New Testament issue. It is found from beginning to end. The tithe of, of the possessions which God has given to us uh, um, it is, 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 a, is a, a foundational truth that we must we must hold ourselves accountable to if we want to truly be blessed. George Mueller said it becomes the servant, it, it, it ill becomes the servant to seek to be rich and great and honored in the world where his Lord was poor, mean, and despised. <laughs> Jesus left all of the riches and glory and came down. And as he says, the birds of the air have their nests, the foxes of the holes of the earth have their holes, but the Son of Man, what? Christ became poor for you so he can give everything that he had to you. And now we think that because of that, now he's just going to pour out all of his blessings on us for us just to become rich. It is your best life now <laughs> mentality. No one knows where that saying comes from. But G.K. Chesterton said this, the road from the eye to the heart that does not go. There is a road from the eye to the heart that does not go through intellect. The Bible says it this way, love not the things of the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life are not of the Father. And we are a generation that thinks with its eyes and listens with its feelings. Let me say that again. We are a generation that thinks with its eyes and listens with its feelings. Do you all understand what that means? We are sick with the things of this world. One writer said, riches enlarge rather than satisfying appetites. This is a very, very, very serious matter. And one very important person, one very wise person said, if you want to know what a person loves, look at what he spends his money on. And if he doesn't spend his money, you know what he loves. By the way, that was me. Praise the Lord. Don't let, my only quote for today. <laughs> so pick up with me. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Let's read the whole entire chapter. Because we're going to see that uh, Deuteronomy is very important as we go through all, all of the Bible, especially the New Testament. But let's just read Deuteronomy chapter, 20, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, and then we're going to come back and we're going to take four truths I think we can learn from this. But I want you to listen to the entire chapter. Deuteronomy chapter 8, picking up in verse 1. And all the commandments which I command thee this day, you shall observe to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord, the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or not. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and, and, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of the, of the Lord, man doth live. 
And thy raiment, thy clothes waxed not old upon thee, neither did thy shoes wear or foot swell these forty years. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord God chasteneth thee. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. And uh, for the Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, and a land of brooks, of water, and of fountains, and of depths that springs out of the valleys and the hills, and a land of wheat, and barley, and vines, and fig trees, and pomegranates, and a land of oil and honey, a land where thou shalt eat bread with scarceness, without scarceness. Thou shalt not lack anything in it, a land whose stones are iron, and out of its hills that, that, that thou mayest dig brass. Thou hast eaten and art full. Then thou shalt bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he hath given to thee. But beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in the keeping of his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I commend you this day. Least when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks have multiplied and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied. Then thine heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness, wherein there were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was neither no water, where he brought forth water out of a rock of flint, who, who fed thee in the wilderness with manna by which your fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and he might prove thee to do thee the good all thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand hath begotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that giveth you power to get wealth. That he may establish his covenant which he swore unto thy fathers as it is this day. And it shall be if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God. And walk after other gods and serve them and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall perish. As the nations which the Lord destroyed before you, so shall ye perish because you would not be obedient to the voice of the Lord your God. Would you pray with me? Father, as we turn our eyes upon this word this morning, may we be able to see the parallel that is between the nation of Israel and what we have called the nation of America, the great United States of America that seems to be falling apart in all of its prosperity and all of its wealth and all of the goodness which you have brought us into and how we have turned from the Lord our God and we have turned to the things of this world and we have begun to look to our prosperity more than the God who gives it. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to see as we begin this stewardship study on how to steward our treasures in which you have given us you have given us all things, and oh, I pray that we will honor you with all of our substance, not just a part of it, because it's, none of it belongs to us. It all belongs to you. You alone give us power to give wealth. And so God, help us to not put our trust in riches, but to put our trust in the Lord, the living God of heaven and earth, from whence will come our help or will become our destruction. And so, Lord, we pray. Help us to see these things, and it's in your name that I pray, and all God's people said. Amen. Deuteronomy is one of the most quoted books in all of the New Testament. And in the New Testament, now I said, Deuteronomy is one of the most quoted books. So if Jesus quoted Deuteronomy a lot of times in the New Testament, Deuteronomy is a what? It's an important book. The only, book that, the only two books that are quoted more than Deuteronomy is Psalms, quoted 68 times, Isaiah quoted 55 times, and Deuteronomy quoted 44 times. So Psalms, Isaiah, and Deuteronomy were the most quoted Old Testament books, amen? And so when we talk about biblical principles, we're not just talking about them in the context of the Old Testament here. Jesus directly quoted from these books to explain his worth, 
his work and his worship. Amen. And so if you want to know what, it's, what, his, what he's worth and, and how he came to work and, and why we should worship him, these books help us to get there. But there were other books also. Genesis was quoted 35 times. Leviticus was quoted 13 times. And Exodus was quoted 31 times. So there are other, other uh, books that Jesus quoted directly and some of the other writers, but mostly out of Deuteronomy and Psalms. And I don't know about you, but I find the book of Psalms to be very beneficial to me. Amen. I would have thought that Proverbs would have been one because I tell you, Proverbs is a great Old Testament book that I love as well. It helps me uh, to know how to be right with God and how to be right with man, people around me. But, but, but Deuteronomy is, was quoted directly by Jesus. And every time Jesus quoted it, it, most of the time it was in a direct response to Satan. When Satan would tempt him, he would say, it is written. <laughs> every time he said that, normally he was quoting from Deuteronomy. And, uh, and so Jesus used the variable power, powerful words of Deuteronomy to silence the devil. How many of y'all know we need to silence the devil right now in our country, in our hearts, in our minds, in our families? Amen? And while the New Testament is greatly beneficial, I'm telling you, what words did Jesus use? <laughs> he used words out of the book of Deuteronomy. And I tell you, that's why I think we should, we, I, I, the Lord has led me to start here. And, uh, but uh, one of our favorite scriptures that we all know so very well comes from the book of Deuteronomy. And it's, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt serve the Lord thy God with all thine heart and all thy soul and all thy might. Amen. Everybody loves that verse. And where does that come from? It comes from the book of Deuteronomy. Amen. Right where we're sitting, two chapters before we get to this place. And so he says, man, in that same chapter, he says, I command you this day that these words shall be in thine heart and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk about them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And so he says, these books will help you to be a good steward of the things which God has given to you. Because how many of y'all know that God is the one who gives us this country and this land? How many of y'all know that? God is the one who's given us this country and this land, just like he gave the land to Israel. And he brought them in there where they had all of these mighty blessings. And boy, have we been blessed beyond compare in the United States of America. But can y'all not tell that we're losing our country day by day? And the whole entire time, what's the main topic of conversation? It's about our pocketbook. It's about the money. Everybody's worried about recession. You know why recession is so hard on us? Because it's affecting our, our money. And so now we got a problem because recession's out of control and we need Trump back to fix our recession problems. Listen, Trump can't fix our recession problems, amen? Only God can fix our recession problems, but it's going to first get at our hearts about the issue of money. Not by might nor by power, the Lord says, but by my spirit, amen? Only God can fix our country, y'all. We don't need to make America great again. We need to make God great in America again. Amen? I'm telling you, when you forget the Lord your God, we're setting ourselves up for doom. And man, we're not teaching our children in our homes when we lie down and when we rise up. We're not talking about it when we go out and when we come in. The only time we talk about church, most of the time, it's when we bring them to church. The rest of the time, we're putting their eyes on the things of the world. We're teaching them how to be worldly and lust and yearn for the things of the world, the fame and the acclamations and all the money to get the best school so you can get the best job so you can make the most money. And I'm telling you, we're ruining them. We're ruining our kids to make them think that money's going to make you happy or make you healthy or make you wise. The Bible warns against the, the, the clutches of riches over and over and over again. It doesn't matter how much money you have if you don't have God. Amen. What does it profit a man if he should gain? Come on, y'all. The whole world and what? What benefit then is it for us to continue to put, pump this lie into the hearts and minds of our children that money can fix all of our problems? There's only one who can fix our problems. And his name is God. Amen. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins because we've gotten our eyes off God and we've got our eyes on our money. One says, listen, the shortest nerve in a man's body is the one who runs from his hand to his wallet. Amen? I believe that. Because when you talk to a man and he wants to spend money on what he wants or he desires, he won't think a second about spending that money. But you ask him to do something for the name of God, to put it in the offering plate, and he say, well, I need to pray about that pressure. <laughs> you didn't pray about whatever else that... Nice, fancy thing you went and bought, did you? 
Oh, no, that was, that was just fine. But now if I got to give to the church, I, you know, I, I, all that preacher ever talks about is money, 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 money. Well, listen, don't you know that God says that you're to bring the money into the storehouse of God, that he may have meat upon his table? He says, how has a man robbed God? How have you robbed God? He says, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. Huh? And God only asked for 10%. And all the Bible, as we'll see later. But so some things we're going to see right here that I think we need to really pay attention to. Now, let me just go ahead and make this statement. As I'm preaching this, I'm preaching a, across the board to the church as a whole, not as to our church. We have a church, y'all. If you can't tell by the financial statements of every month that this church receives for the amount of parishioners in which we have, we are blessed beyond measure. In the worst time our country has ever seen, we have been blessed financially like crazy. But here's what I do know, that there are not all of us tithing the way God would say to tithe. I know that for a fact. I can see it in the rise and the fall of every week's giving and every month's giving. It doesn't stay on a steady, consistent plane. It rises and it falls with tremendous ups and downs when it should be steady across the board. Because I'm not giving out of what I have left over. I'm giving first of what God has given to me. Amen. So if I can't afford TV, then guess what? I don't have TV because God's first. If I can't afford the gas in my boat, then I don't go on my boat because God comes first. Or whatever the case may be, whatever your lifestyle is, whatever you like to do, if God is last, my friend, you've got it out of order. God is not last. God is what? No, let's say that again. God is not last. God is what? God is first. Is God first in your life when it comes to giving? Out of your money? Isn't that what it is? Whose money is it? It's your, it's your money? Oh, really? Is it really your money? I can tell you this. You just keep on with that mindset that it's my money. I made it. I worked hard for that. And I'll show you what God will do with it. He says it's cankered. And it's a witness against you. And it will bring you into utter bondage. And it will, it will tear you down just like, just like this story we read about this billionaire who had a first one to ever make a billion dollars. And that, in that state of a billion dollars, he was miserable. No hope, no life, no future. And then when he realized, oh, shoot, this is not helping me. This is hurting me. Let me give it away. And what began to happen? He began to get better. Oh, how I pray. I wished he would have come to Christ. But nevertheless... It is a challenge, and I realize that today as we talk about our countries uh, in the recession and, I mean, in the, um, in, the, in the prices of everything going through the roof and everything that's, that's around us and the uncertainty of our day to talk about giving. But, hey, listen, I tell you what, this is the way God tests us the most right here. God tests us the most right here in this truth. But prosperity is very, very dangerous. It, there's, a, there's a fine line and balance in which we must... Must fact, because if we don't, if we get it out of balance and we get it reversed, we'll do ourselves great harm and we will bring ourselves to destruction. And that's why I say you ought to be able to see this uh, as personally in your own life as you look and see what the country's doing. As the country has forgotten God, God's putting a squeeze on our money, is he not? And he's putting us in some, in some bad places. But prosperity has the danger of leading to self-indulgence. It has the danger of leading us to forget God, and it has a danger to lead us into pride and self-reliance. We're going to talk about that as we go through this morning, but this, this, this is where we're going to go. But I want you to hear what Matthew 6, 19 says. It says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust do corrupt, but where thieves, and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. What I want you to understand this morning, what I'm talking about, is I want to give you the opportunity to stop building treasures just for yourself here upon the earth, which you can't take with you, and start storing it for yourself treasures in heaven. But I can tell you that if you'll start storing it for yourself treasures in heaven, God will bless you richly upon the earth. This is a principle that is absolutely found all throughout Scripture. He says, because where your heart is, or there, where, I'm sorry, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is your heart and treasure in God or is in the stuff in which we have upon this earth. And so the verses that are set before us, we need to recognize really plainly and clearly that the only reason we have a country, the only reason you can go to work today, look, look at me. The only reason you exist today is because God has been gracious and merciful to you. Amen? Amen. You're still breathing today only because there's a God in heaven. So if you get up and go to work, it's not because it's you 
who gets up and goes to work, it's because God allows you to get up and go to work. Amen? And God believes in work. And God believes in doing the work of your hands. And we're not talking about not having stuff here today. But we're saying making sure God is put first before our stuff. Amen? That's what we're talking about. God is first. But God makes the way to prosperity. Pick up with me chapter 8 and verse 1. Follow along in your Bible. Oh, I pray you got a Bible so you can follow along and recognize that this is not Pastor Toby's idea. It's not my topic. This is God's Word. Amen. God speaks to us. And if you don't have your own Bible, I pray you get one. Uh, these are important times for us to know the Word of God. But in chapter 8, verse 1, he picks up and says, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe and to do. Has God done away with this Word? Has God said you don't have to follow His commandments anymore? No. Now, the Bible says that Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill them. Amen. Now, we are set free from the law. We are not under the bondage of the law. We're not, we, don't make our, we don't make ourselves right to God by the law, but we should keep the law because we're made right by God. Amen. Because of the grace that God has given to us, we observe the law because we know the law is good. Amen. The law is righteous and it's, and it's truth and it steers us in the right direction. And so we follow the law just simply because God has saved us and commanded us that we should do what he calls us to do. Jesus would say it this way. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? That's Jesus' words. And so let me tell you what Jesus quoted. He quoted the Old Testament over and over and over again <laughs> saying, listen, listen to me. Let me teach you. Let me show you how to walk and live in this life so that you don't get things reversed and out of order because God is the one who makes it prosperous. And so he says, he says, now listen. He says, now why do you do that? Now watch what he says. He says, I command you this day that you shall observe and to do that you may live, right? And then notice what it says. And multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swear unto you by your fathers. We didn't make America. God brought us to America. And how many of y'all glad you live in America right now? Say amen. amen. We get to go and do whatever we want to do today, don't we? Even in the middle of all this recession. I mean, uh, uh, not recession. I'm going to keep saying recession. We're going, we're going into a recession here soon, I believe it. I believe we're going to start going back down soon. But, but I mean, we're in inflation right now. Everything's going through the roof, is it not? Going through the roof. But man, when God brought us into this country, was it not a blessing? And then these people over there today who's having these bombs dropped on their head don't know what they're doing. Man, don't you know they wish they could, they could uh, come out from underneath that? But I'm just telling you, just like, the, just like the land of Israel. I mean, God brought us to this land and he's given us great wealth. But look at verse 2. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord God has led thee these 40 years. We've been a country for almost 250 years. And has God not been good to us? Has he not brought us out from under bondage of our forefathers before us and given us this great land? And then notice what he says. Have I not led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what is in thine heart? Why does God bring us through hard times? Why does he allow us to go into hard times? So he'd know what? He'd know our heart. And that's why I said so. What's going to be the first thing you stop giving to if the country goes bankrupt? Will it be God? Or will you try to hold on to all your stuff first? This is going to be a question that he's tried them with. What was most important to them? You remember what they did? They mumbled and griped and complained because they didn't have all the stuff they had in, in Egypt. God was not enough for them. Is God enough for you today? If you had nothing but had only God, would he be enough? Would you be able to worship him like those Ukrainian Christians are worshiping him today in a subway? With nothing, no home, no job, no future, no, no retirement, no 401k, no, no nothing. And yet, look at how they're praising God today. Is that the kind of faith that you have? That if God was to allow us to go into that kind of place, that you would be there praising God and not complaining to God? But praising, they're praising God. I don't think they ain't praying and asking God to make this come to an end because they are. But they're down there praising God and giving him the glory and saying, listen, it's up to God what God does. They realize it's God's, but notice what he says in verse 3. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger. And then when he suffered them to hunger, what did he do? He fed them. Amen. Even though they didn't have anything, they had everything they needed because they had what? They had God, the one who provides all things. He said he fed it with manna. And your fathers didn't even know what manna was. <laughs> and he says that thou mayest know what? That man lives by bread alone. And every word, but, but every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, doth man live. Notice what it says in verse 4. Thy raiment waxed not old upon thee, and neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. He said your clothes didn't wear out, and your shoes didn't wear out. How many of y'all glad you've got shoes to wear today? How many of you glad you got clothes to wear today? How many of y'all have suffered for the lack of shoes and clothes in our country? Has any of us in here went without clothes and shoes? 
Has any of us went, went without food? <laughs> Some of us probably should. <laughs> I'm one of them, praise the Lord. I could probably go a lot less with a lot less food, couldn't you? But God has been faithful, has he not? He's given us not only food, not only our daily bread, but man, we've got bread whenever we want it, amen. And as much as we want, we can go to the refrigerator or the pantry any time and find all that we want to eat and put on any, any how many of us have more than five, five changes of clothes in here? Raise your hand. More than five changes of clothes. Uh, how, many, how many changes of clothes do we got to have? I mean, I asked my wife how many pairs of shoes that she got to have. Shh, don't let me get in trouble. Shh, be quiet, be quiet, be quiet. Shh, shh, don't, don't go there. Because now she says, well, now you got more shoes than I got. And I say, yeah, but they were given to me, praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But really, I mean, don't, 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 we, don't we have a ton of stuff, y'all? And look at us. Running around like we got nothing. And yet God says, you've got everything and more than you could possibly stand. If I didn't give you anything else, you'd survive for months. Notice what he says. Verse 5. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord God chasteneth what? You know what that means? It means discipline. Do you discipline your children? Why do you discipline your children? Why not just let them do whatever they want to do? By the way, they're their own person. They got their own mind. They got their own, their own will, their own emotions. Let them be whatever they... Come on, y'all, say it with me. Let them be what? Whatever they want to be. No, you don't let your children be whatever they want to be. You teach them what is right and good. Amen. And that's the reason you discipline them. Not because you don't love them. You discipline them because you do love them. Amen. And they get their eyes on things which they don't really think they, I mean, they really don't know they don't need. How many of y'all here have taught y'all's kids not to touch or not stick a knife in the electric plug? Because they'll go and take that knife and want to stick it right where? Right in there. You see, well, let's, let, let, just go and let Johnny do it. He'll, he'll find out in a second. <laughs> and then you say, I bet every day you won't do it again. <laughs> right? Well, sometimes my grandpa would let me do that because you know why? He could tell me a thousand times not to do it. And you know what I do? I do it anyway. But once I did it, guess what? I didn't do it again. Praise the Lord. Sometimes he had to let me just go ahead and experience the pain that was going to happen because he said, I've tried to tell you that that's not good for you. But since you won't listen, then just go on and do it. And you're going to find out. And how many of us here have learned by the hard knocks of life not to do what my mom and dad told me not to do? Amen. I could have saved myself so much trouble if I would listened to my mom. But I could have saved myself a whole lot more trouble if I just listened to the God who gave me life. He's the one who's given me the right to live. He's the one who says, listen, I am the owner and the maker. I own the manual to it. If you go to Walmart or you buy any product and you got this in a box, inside of that box there's these things called the instruction manual. You know why you have an instruction manual in that box? Because you didn't make the thing. And so men in here... Unlike we do most of the time, we pull the thing out, throw the instruction manual away, and then we realize, oh, shoot, we should have started with the instruction manual because we done messed something up, right? But that instruction manual is in there because the person who made that product knows how it's supposed to work and what it's supposed to do. And when you take those instruction manuals and you throw them out and you only do whatever you want to do with it, eventually it either breaks or it hurts something, does it not? And he says, listen, I am the owner, and I gave you an instruction manual when you were born that you came with an instruction manual. Every one of us came with an instruction manual that tells us how to help shape our minds, our wills, and our emotions to know that there's a God in heaven who gives all things and to submit ourselves unto him. As he says, teach them when you lie down and when you rise up and when you go out and when you come in, you put it on the doorposts of your house and on your gates and everywhere you go, you tell them about who? The Lord? Yes, that's what we're supposed to be doing. So I'm supposed to talk about Jesus that much? Yes. Yes. Because if you only talk about God just a little bit and they get the rest of the world the rest of the time, what's going to be their most biggest influence? God of the world. And everything that you do in life is a teaching opportunity to teach your children and teach ourselves and remind ourselves that there is a God who says there are some things that are good for us and some things that are bad for us. And if we choose to do the bad, it's going to hurt. But if we choose to do what is good, it's going to be beneficial, is it not? I have found that following the Lord makes my life better. And one of the areas that I really struggle with 
As, as, a, as a saved person was this issue of tithing. And I can tell you story after story after story of people who struggle with tithing. But when they finally came to the conclusion that the Bible was right on tithing, and they started tithing like the Bible said to do, God blessed them richly. I promise you, God is not a liar. Amen? One writer put it this way. If money fell from the sky like rain, snow or, or like snow or manna, we could perhaps more readily admit that it came from God. But because it comes through the command uh, to work, and work being what man does, he thinks he produces his wealth himself. What we acquire comes by the providence of God. Only a perverted imagination allows a man to believe that he is the genius that is the one who's brought it all to pass. It is God who's allowed you to have what you have today. The Bible says that the Lord reigns upon the just and the unjust. That means the holy and the unholy. And I can tell you what, there's a lot of people in this world who got a lot of money that don't know God at all. Prosperity is not a sign that you are in the blessing of God. Sometimes you're under the curse of God. Actually, the, the blessing of your father, the devil, you should say. Because that's where it really comes from. For all of this in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the face, and the pride of life are all of, not of the Father. So where does it come from? It comes from the enemy, the adversary, who tries to pull us in with the lust of our eyes, the lust of our flesh, and the pride of life. Is it not? And when we get something new, what do we want to do with it? We want to show it off, don't we? We want to show everybody what we've gotten. And God says, listen, the only reason you've gotten it is because I have given it to you. So pick up with me now. Notice what he says in verse 6. Therefore, thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God and walk in his ways and what? And fear him, right? And that's one thing we've noticed in our country. The fear of God is gone. There is no fear of God. There's only the fear of what God may do as we watch what's going on around the world right now. Verse 7. For the Lord thy God bringeth thee. Now what's it? What was it? Who, brought, who brings us into the good land? The Lord thy God bringeth thee into the good land, and a land of brooks and of water and of fountains of depths and of springs of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and of barley and of vines and fig trees and pomegranates and lands of oil and honey. Who gave us all those things? Our own work, our own efforts? No, God. Man can put it in the ground, but if God don't bless it, it don't grow. Amen. <laughs> Period. It is God who lets us get all that we have. It's him who made the gold and the silver. It's him who brings it all to pass. A land where thou shalt eat bread without scarceness. Oh boy, surely that's us. Thou shalt not lack anything in it. A land whose stones are iron. No, we can go and build stuff out of what God has given us. The very dirt and the hills that thou mayest dig brass. The resources of our country that back our money is what God says. The reason you have those things is because I have done those things. Verse 10, and when thou eat, and when thou hast eaten and art full, then shalt thou bless the Lord thy God for the good land which he's given you. Amen. And let me tell you what we ought to do this morning. We ought to bless God because he has made us prosperous. Amen. Amen. It's not because of you, though. It's because of God. God is the way to prosperity. But prosperity can lead to the forgetfulness of God. Hence, the country in which we're living. Notice what he says here. Pick up with me now. Verse 11. Because this is, the, this is it. Notice I'm pulling these right out of scripture. I'm not putting my thoughts on the scripture. The scriptures are telling you what happens. That when God brings us into a land and blesses us like that. Notice what he says. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God. Not in the keeping of his commandments and his judgments and his statutes. Tithing is a command. It's a judgment. It's a statute. And he says you ought to keep it just like keeping your time and using your talents, also your treasures. All these things belong to God. God's the one who gives them and he expects you to give back out of them. Amen. Out of your time, out of your talent, out of your treasure. But in doing so, you don't lose. <laughs> this is what I've come to learn. When you give to God, listen, he's got a bigger shovel than you. <laughs> he's got a bigger bank account than you. <laughs> He says, I am the God and I own the earth and everything that dwells therein. Amen. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I shall supply all of your needs according to what? My riches and glory. Amen. And don't you know that everything on the earth is going to melt with fervent heat anyway? Don't you know it's all going to pass away? Don't you know like John D. Rockefeller, every one of us is going to come to the end of our life one day. It ain't going to matter how much money you've got. But it will matter if you have forgotten the Lord or you have remembered him. It will matter significantly because not only can it lead to, for, to the forgetfulness of God, God, because notice what he goes down to say. He says, at least you forget the Lord thy God. And look at verse 12. At least when thou hast eaten and thou art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. 
Notice what it says here. And when thy herds and thy flocks have multiplied and thy silver and thy gold has multiplied and all thy has has multiplied. See, this is what jo this is what Joel Osteen preaches right here. This is what he preaches. That God just wants to bless your socks off. He wants to give you your best life now. Let me. Do, I'm going to say this. If this is your best life now, you're on your way to hell later. I, I promise you your life to come is going to be better than the life you live now. I, pro I promise you your best life is not now. God will bless you in this life right now, but this will not be your best life now. Don't believe it for a second because most of the time when this happens, notice what he says here. And when thy herds and thy flocks are multiplied and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, man, has not God been gracious in doing that? And then notice what he says. And then verse 14. And then thine heart be what? Thine heart be lifted up and then what happens? And thou what? So he says riches and prosperity, what's it normally lead to? What's it normally lead to? Forgetting the Lord. Has our country forgot the Lord? Have we not multiplied? Has our not, have, have we not been multiply blessed? And have we not done exactly what the Bible says? Beware, beware, do not let this happen to you. Because it can happen, it's very easy. Because riches will take a hold to you. But not only will it lead to forgiveness of God, but it will lead to pride and self-reliance. Pick up with me in verse uh, 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness? He says, who's brought you through all the trials and difficulties you come through, basically right here, where the fiery serpents and scorpions and drought, where there was no water? Who's brought you through all the hard times in your life out here sitting in the pew this morning? Who is it that's brought you through all the times of scarcity and all the times of trouble? Who's the one who sustained you through all that you've been through? Basically, it's what he's asking Israel. Who's done that? Has it been because of your efforts that you have sustained? No, it's because of God. Notice what he says here. He says, Who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thou fathers knew not, that he might humble thee, that he might prove thee to do that which is good at the latter end. And then in verse 17, look what he says. Look, 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 look at this. And thou say in thine heart, what? My power, my power and my might of my own hand have gotten me what? Mm-hmm. You see what happens when we get prosperity? We think, we've the, we think we're the ones who's made it. You may have had a part in it by doing what God told you to do by working. But let me just tell you, in an instant, God can take all of your wealth away. Just as fast as he can give it to you, he can take it away. And so he wants to get at your heart to say this is a heart issue. It's not about if you have money or you don't have money. He says, but when you get it, make sure that you operate it properly. That it doesn't take a hold of you. That you keep a hold of it. Amen? Because it can, it can take a hold to your heart very easily. And so he says, don't do this. He says, don't you say. Don't you say my power and my might of my own hand had gotten me this wealth. Don't you dare say that. Because if God hadn't got you here in the United States of America, you wouldn't be making money in the first place. You could be just like those people over there today. And do you think that God doesn't love them because he's allowing that to happen over their heads? Do you think that God doesn't love those Ukrainian Christians today? Somebody say, oh no. Yes, he loves them. Amen. Amen. Verse 18. Because notice what it says here. Because prosperity will either be a blessing or a curse to us. And we better figure it out. And I quit. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. Notice what it says here. For it is he that giveth you power to get wealth. God gives you the power to get wealth, but not for your own purposes, but for his. Whatever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. Amen? It's not for your glory. It's for God. But while you serve God, God will richly bless you and allow you to have multiple blessings, man. I mean, imagine thy herds multiplying and thy silver and thy gold multiplying. That's what God desires as a, as a covenant to us. But notice what he says. It's either a blessing or a curse because it's God who gives it to us. And then he says these words, uh, verse 19, And it shall be that if thou do it all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other stuff. That's what gods are, little G-O-D-S right there. That's the stuff. If you walk after the stuff rather than the God who's giving you that ability and serve them and worship them, that's why I said you want to know what a man loves, look what he spends his money on. And then notice what it says here. I testify against you this day. Now look at this. Look at me. I testify against you this day that what? I will make you to what? I will make you to perish. So this can be a blessing <laughs> or it could be a curse. Amen? And I'm sad to say that for many of our, us in the United States of America, that our prosperity, just like it did with the nation of Israel, has caused us 
to be in the process of perishing rather than experiencing the abundant blessing of God. And so he says, As the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face, so shall ye perish, because you would not be what? You would not be obedient to the Lord by God. What I'm telling you here today is you don't have to actually look here to see the problem that the Bible is addressing. You can look all around us and you can see the evidence of it in every home and, every, and, and, and in this nation predominantly running right now. Can you not see it? And that's why I say if we get these things put back in place, if we could have revival, amen, if we could have revival, do you think that God can restore our country? Do you think God can save us from, from utter demise and death and destruction? Do you think he could do that? Yes. Yes. Do you believe that God loves you this morning? If you do, say amen. amen. No, see, that's what I'm talking about. No, do you believe God loves you? Say amen. amen. And everything that he's given to you has been for your blessing and your prosperity. But don't get it mixed up and make it a curse when God meant for it to be a blessing. Amen. Make sure that he's first in your life on every level with your time, your talent, and your treasure. And we're going to get into exactly what is the tithe because a lot of people don't even know what a tithe is or how much or why should I tithe. We're going to start talking about that next week. The next three weeks we're going to, or next week and then the week following after the missionaries are here, we'll finish tithing. But y'all know this. Listen to me. As we come to this year, how many sermons on tithing have you ever heard me preach in three years? I never preach on money, so don't go out here saying that this preacher wants to talk about money. I never talk about money. I just talk about, man, listen, whatever you do, you do it all to the glory of God. Amen? And that comes with your money and everything else in between. But this is a specific time when we're talking about stewardship. And in the stewardship, I have to deal with the subject of money. And it may just prove that if you get upset about it, that the shortest nerve in your body is the one that runs from your hand to your pocketbook. And if that's the case, it's not me you should be mad at. You should go talk to God about it. Because this is God's word, not my word. Amen? And it matters. And either we're going to be obedient or we're not. Either we're going to be blessed or we're going to be cursed. And I want your family, and I want you to be blessed beyond measure. I want you to be blessed beyond measure. I want us to know that there's a God in heaven that says, I want to bless your socks off. But don't you get it mixed up because if you take those blessings and you make them what you love more than me, I will bring you to utter demise. You will perish. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word and the reminder of the word this morning. And as we're all sitting around here and we all got busy days planned out, busy things to do once we leave this place. Oh, God, forgive us for being impatient to listen to your word, to sit and to endure the chastening of the Lord, which is good for us. Lord, I thank you that you've chastened my heart and life in this area and that you've showed me how that if I will seek your kingdom first and your righteousness and all these things that the Gentiles seek after, you just add them to my life. I don't go seeking for them. You bring them and set them down at my front door. God, I thank you for the blessing that you've put in my life and how you've taught me to trust you with my riches, my wealth that you've given to me. It's yours in the end. It's all yours. And I thank you, God, that you've shown me the way the path of being prosperous and how to not let it take a hold to my life but let me take a hold of it and use it for your glory and if you're here this morning and you know you've never trusted Christ and you know that by the way you even look at this passage of scripture or this type of, of, of sermon you know whether or not you're walking in obedience to it or not or in defiance to it and God's just simply saying you're missing you're the one missing out if you'll do what I tell you to do I'll bless you but if you make it what you want it to be, it will curse you. If you're here this morning and you know you need to trust Christ, please don't be impatient with the Spirit of God for the sake of others around you. But be patient with for yourself. And pray right now. If you would, would you just pray right now for the person next to you? And say, oh God, would you help the person to my right understand the reality and the benefit of being a good steward when it comes to tithing, when it comes to talent, when it comes to time. For Lord, I know you want to bless them. And Lord, for the person on my left, I pray that you would show them as well the blessings that you want to pour out on their life and the way you want them to be a good steward of their tithe. But Lord, I pray you help me. Help me 
to see how to be a good and wise steward for the things that you've given to me. If you're here this morning, you need to trust Christ. I'm going to be to my left, your right, here in just a moment. We're going to stand and we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. It is your time to respond. Maybe you need to trust Christ today. Or maybe you just need to ask God for forgiveness today. That you have not been the person that has put him first in your life. Well, listen, whatever you need to do, I pray you do it all now in the wonderful and the gracious and the merciful and the forgiving name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said.